Okay, so I will trust you to uh, help me with the doorknob, <laughs> the doorbell. <laughs> sure. Where? And, so where um, where does that happen? Because I don't know where the um in the uh, people come up in the participants, and that's where you okay. can see what everybody's doing. And then um, if there's anything you want to put in the chat, that's okay. Sounds All good. All right. So I'm going to start the session. Welcome to Paramook 2023. The course is officially called Parapsychology Research and Education and was founded in 2015 by my late husband, Carlos S. Alvarado, and myself. I would like to say that this year we're doing apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists, and that was actually his idea when we finished the 2020 uh, edition of Paramook. We started this course at February on February 28th, and the live sessions will end on April 1st. Um, I am Nan, your moderator. That's me. I would like to thank Brian Williams from the Psychical Research Foundation, who's a member of the organizing team and also the guy who put together the curriculum this 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 year. And Natasha Chisdis, who is from Chis Film. I also want to say thank you to Lisa Coley and Anastasia Damalis of the Parapsychology Foundation. The PF has supported this course from the very beginning, and we couldn't do it without you. So thank you very much, you guys. So today we have Lloyd Auerbach, whose talk is called Apparitions, Consciousness Beyond Death, and today's Friday, March 17th. Lloyd is the director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations with 43 years of experience investigating the paranormal and over 40 years teaching courses on parapsychology. He is the president of the Forever Family Foundation on the board of the Rhine Research Center and teaches online parapsychology courses for the Rhine Education Center and Atlantic University. He is the author or co-author of nine books on the paranormal and is also a performing mentalist. In this presentation, veteran parapsychological field investigator and educator Lloyd Auerbach will discuss apparitional experiences and phenomena as evidence for consciousness survi surviving bodily death. He'll first examine differences between the various ghostly phenomena of apparitions, hauntings, and poltergeists, and then segue, segue into different categories of apparitions. He'll present some common sense questions in relation to the evidence that can lead quickly to the dismissal of much folklore about ghosts. From there, he'll briefly discuss theories and models of apparitions, why they may stick around, and what makes a great evidential apparition case. He'll finish up with a deep dive into cases that provide strong evidence for apparitions as an interactive consciousness without a physical body. Lloyd, you can, I'm going to stop sharing and okay. you can take the floor. All right. And I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okie dokie. So uh, welcome everybody. And uh, I'm happy to be here and talking about one of my favorite topics. So let me just go ahead and make sure I can progress my slides here. All right, so let's start out just simply separating the phenomena. Now I, I do, because uh, I talk to people sometimes in other countries, um, in the UK and other places as well. I've had students in other places. And just these are the terms that many of us use within the US. I know that poltergeist has slightly different meanings in other places, and I'm gonna get into that in a moment. But we're, the way I look at these particular types of cases is that apparitions are interactive, they're survival of consciousness, that's that basic evidential piece that I'm going to be talking for the most part about tonight. Hauntings are recordings or imprints, place memory of past events, but not necessarily related to the dead. And I think it's really important to make that distinction. And then poltergeists relate, the way we use it uh, comes from Bill Roll and Nandor Fodor and others bef before and since. That's living agent psychokinesis, unconscious. So the term poltergeist, first of all, um, there was a presentation at the Parapsychological Association a number of years ago where some folks uh, from Germany had done a deep dive into the literature uh, in Germany and found the word poltergeist was first used as far back as at least the 16th century. So that term has been coined a long time ago. And 
we have to remember that words do change meaning. You know, one example is the word computer before computers were created by IBM. A computer was a person who actually computed things. So this is a definition from the Glossary <laughs> of the Psychological Association. And it's really, uh, just to summarize this, poltergeist phenomena is, phys is physical phenomena. Rarely do we have apparitional phenomena connected to that. In other words, seeing a figure. It happens in some cases, but for the most part, we're dealing with purely physical phenomena of a wide range of effects. Uh, electronic effects these days are, are much more common than some of the wraps on the walls, at least here in the United States. So when we talk about poltergeist phenomena, the term that Bill Roll and J.G. Pratt came up with from a case in on Long Island, Seaford, Long Island, 1958, is recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. We're talking about living agent PK, in other words, the unconscious of some living person. And that model goes back not only to 1958, but in some respects, if you look at the re research and writings of Nandor Fodor and Herbert Carrington, you'll find that there is an indication that uh, Fodor really looked from a psychoanalytic perspective at the living person, the living agent as the responsible cause of the phenomena. So you can test this in the scientific method because you can actually, one, one question is how do we get this to stop? And the answer to that has been working with the, the identified living agent and the phenomena stops. So if we are dealing with apparitions or spirits or something else, it's kind of weird that they would leave when you do some counseling with the identified agent or an identified agent, All right? I did want to mention the difference. Um, I'm dealing with a, an author friend of mine in the UK who's writing a book on haunted places, and she's going to include some haunt, some famous poltergeist cases. But the fact is that she's included a couple of cases that we would not consider poltergeist cases here in the States. And I had a conversation via email with Guy Lyon Playfair before he died. I wasn't even aware of this distinction. Um, he told me that in very often in the UK and other parts of the world, and I did see this in other places around the world, that the term poltergeist refers to any case with physical activity, regardless of what the source is for that activity. And then they, you make a distinction based on who or what is causing that seems to be. So it's either an apparition case or a living agent case, F, but it's identified first as a poltergeist case. We kind of flip that here in the States. And I think that's partly because of Bill Roll. Um, we're dealing with physical activity, but there are no indicators of, of conscious apparitions at all really focused on living agent cases, if the apparition is present in a case and there's PK activity, we have found that there are sometimes cases where the apparition can affect things. In other words, apparitional PK. That's a feature of an apparition case, but the physical phenomena in a poltergeist case is on its own without any indication of spirit. I have over the years worked with a number of psychics and mediums who are really good with apparition cases and actually identifying when things aren't around Never once uh, did they find that there was a sort, an apparitional source for the PK activity in a poltergeist case. When we talk about apparitions, this is my definition. So it's that which is perceived, seemingly seen, heard, felt, or smelled. I don't think they're tasted too often. Uh, related to some part of the human personality, mind, soul, consciousness that can somehow exist in our physical universe after the death of the body or projected outside the, the living body. When I, I emphasize perceived here, because this becomes very important when we talk about what an apparition might actually be and how people are experiencing that potential apparition. Uh, and that is that our perceptions are not the same as our senses. Our senses provide data. Our perceptions make sense of that, pull that together, and we end up with a view of the world from those perceptions. When someone has an extrasensory perception or a non-sensory perception, uh, non-local consciousness information coming in, that can get added to your perceptions that come that are pulling together what you get in your senses as well. Right, when we do cases, um, we focus on human cases. I have had a few people who have had apparitions of their pets, a couple of really interesting ones over the years. So primarily humans is what we're dealing with. The term haunting, you know, is about place memory. It's a seemingly some perception of information about activity and people um, in the environment that has somehow been recorded into that environment. It's like the place has memory. And it could be, we consider it 
a form of psi perception or clairvoyance or ESP, but it also could be a form of biological perception if it turns out that maybe the Earth's magnetic field or something else in the environment that we're not aware of is holding information. Perhaps our brains are capable of picking that up. But what's important here is a couple of things. Number one, first of all, remember that the word haunt can refer to a place. In fact, it typically does relate to a place when you say a haunt, uh, someplace frequented by a group of people or a single person. So technically, uh, the bar in the TV show Cheers was a bar haunted by many people who were still alive, Norman Cliff in particular. Uh, we haunt our own homes. And that is not just in a physical manner, we actually leave impressions behind in our own homes as well, in places. So our key question when we're trying to separate apparitions from hauntings is whether it's conscious or whether this is a recording, or for those of us old enough to remember, is it live or is it Memorex? Now, what's interesting about a haunting is, and this is something that um, I run into and I've, it's, it's talked about by ghost hunters, but not just by ghost hunters, by a lot of folks, that if somebody died, they assume the place is haunted or there's an assumption and some belief systems, that is the case. Our realtors here in California have to disclose whether someone died within the location within three years. And that's because of certain cultural beliefs that groups of people here who might be buyers have in California, they're afraid that there might be something left behind. Maybe not an actual conscious apparition, but something of that person's energy left behind. The reality is when we look at these cases very carefully, it seems that the living leave the impressions behind. Uh, it could be activities, impressions of uh, perceptions of activities, emotions, other kinds of information from the living, not from the dead. So and that can include pets as well. And that somehow gets into the physical environment. So when we are dealing with a place where somebody died, there should not be an assumption that someone actually left something behind, that there is a, an impression, a, a haunt left behind. Uh, in fact, when people are alive, we leave impressions behind. Probably the most common haunting people have experienced or form a place memory is going house hunting or apartment hunting. And you walk into a place and the decor is okay and it doesn't smell bad, but you get a bad vibe. And you might find if you really dug into the people who own that place that are trying to sell or the last residence there, that there was some highly charged emotional stuff going on between those people, maybe very negative, maybe they're selling the house because of a divorce, or the people just weren't nice. On the other hand, you can go to a place where it was a very loving home and people talk about that all the time, that this place just feels like it's got good vibes. So it's living people that leave those impressions behind, even historical imprints. The thing that's important to remember is that um, somebody could be dead now, but left an impression behind when they were alive. Just like Boris Karloff made a whole bunch of movies when he was alive, but we can watch those movies now, even though he is dead. So what gets recorded here is the good, the bad, the neutral. Um, one of the most common things I've heard over the years, uh, and I just talked to somebody the other day who was, was I'm expressing this in a class. She said, oh, our house, used, we used to get that in our house. The kitchen. People hear the sounds of pots and pans rattling or people cooking in the kitchen when there's nobody there. And it's it's probably because the kitchen's the heart of the home. We all kind of congregate in social events around the kitchen, and we may be leaving that kind of emotion and, and impression behind for us to pick up psychically. So the environment records information. We don't know exactly how much and, and how deep that goes. Uh, it records the events, the emotion in people. And people will experience it as a sense of energy, like that good vibes or bad vibes. They might get a visual. They might hear the sounds of pots and pans rattling. So that's what it seems like, even though you can't really record that. We might get some smells that connect to the previous people who live there. Even from your own impressions, people have been known to occasionally see a, a vision of themselves walking down the hall towards themselves, which freaks them out even more than anything else. They might get physical sensations. And sometimes people report experiencing what's going on as if they're part of it, like becoming part of the a participant in the event. They are feeling in their body something was done to someone, as well as the fact that they're just getting the, the other information impressions behind. But none of that is interactive. It's often repetitive. Uh, it may have a, a strict pattern of when it happens, uh, but it is not an interactive thing. You can't 
ask a question of that figure walking towards you and expect number one, a reaction of any kind, and number two, a response to the question you ask. The question then becomes, why are some things recorded um, and not others? We don't know. I'll just say that. Um, it seems to be high emotional content, positive or negative. People tend to report to us the negatives, although I've had some very positive cases, including one of my earliest haunting cases where the imprint left behind by a couple who were definitely still alive, previous owners of this very new house, uh, were the two of them making love loud in a separate bedroom upstairs that the new people were hearing on a nightly basis. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be the negative stuff. When we get to apparitions, the big question if we're talking about survival of consciousness, well, besides what is consciousness, which of course is a major question, and I'll just let you know that um, when I get, when skeptics say, well, where's your proof that ghosts exist? And I'll, I'll explain, you know, first of all, we're talking about the survival of consciousness. So where's your proof that consciousness exists? I mean, we can take a philosophical approach. There's a lot of different ideas of what consciousness actually is in the body. And it ranges from the ma truly materialist perspective to one where we are literally non-logical consciousness and our bodies and brains are just the receivers Inter, the interface with the physical world. So it ranges quite a bit. So the question, is an apparition a conscious being? Uh, well, we look at, is a human, living human, a conscious being? And hopefully with interactive activity and an indication of self-awareness, we can say that person is conscious. Although I don't know about you, but I've met several people that you look in their eyes and you're not quite sure they're all there. So um, with apparitions, a term that we use, of course, in the literature has been discarnate entities. We are all incarnate entities. We are embodied entities, not disembodied entities, because we have a body. But also apparitions can fall into the category of apparitions of the living, which seem to be projections of consciousness. And I'll get into that here in a bit. So these categories, which are modified slightly from uh, the book Apparitions by GNM Terrell and some of his other writings, we have crisis apparitions, which are pretty clearly projections of some kind. In a crisis apparition, someone who knows you, uh, a loved one, a good friend, a relative, sees you and sees that there's something wrong. They have a visual impression of you. There's something wrong with you. Uh, maybe you look like you're in pain. Uh, you're distraught in some way. And your experience is being just having that experience. You're in an accident. You are sick, very, very ill. You are emotionally upset, like extremely upset. And somehow you are projecting or connecting with that person who then sees you as an apparition. But there's really not a lot of interaction there other than um, this recognition that this is happening. Along with that, we have other apparitions of the living. And we have the spontaneous type and the intentional or experimental type. Um, spontaneous, of course, happens just without our intending, intentional, experimental, I'll go into these a little bit more, happen when we're trying to be seen by other folks. And then, of course, we have deathbed apparitions, which are the apparitions that are seen or perceived by people who are terminally ill, who are in the process of dying, and the big category, apparitions of the dead. So again, crisis apparitions are apparitions witnessed by people and the apparition represents someone who is in some form of crisis. And there are a lot of these on record that happen, but they do seem to be more of a projection of consciousness rather than an actual separation of consciousness. With apparitions of living, um, you can have someone who has an out-of-body experience and they are they travel in that OBE and they visit someone or, or go someplace where there are people. And then the next day they find out that people saw them and was, were wondering what you were doing there and why did you disappear suddenly? Or they saw you as a figure that didn't quite seem solid. So <clears throat> those can happen unintentionally. Um, I myself have had uh, a couple of unintentional OBEs uh, where I had this experience, which was confirmed by somebody contacting me saying, hey, you came to visit me. And that was my experience in my OBE that I visited someone and apparently that person saw me. That happened very early in my career when I was working at the ASPR in New York and being influenced heavily by uh, Carlos Osis, the research director, and Alex Tanis, who is our research participant in the out-of-body experience research that was done there and an amazing psychic himself. 
So you can have unintentional OBEs. You can have the experimental ones where somebody like Alex, who could consciously go out of body, might try to be seen by someone or visit. And there were some really interesting uh, cases that, or stories he told about that very thing. Deathbed apparitions. Um, this goes way back. I think one of the, the first, if not one of the first books on this very specific category was Deathbed Visions by Sir William Barrett. It was reprinted in the uh, 1980s uh, by Aquarian Press in the UK. Uh, really interesting book. So these are experiences of dying people. Typically, when they're really close to death, they perceive apparitions of relatives, loved ones, or other figures, maybe a being of light or some religious figure that's there to help them transit transition to the other side. Now, what's interesting here is that a lot of these are reported by hospice workers or people in families who are gathered around that person. And along with many, uh, but certainly not all of these, the person who is dying may be in coma or may have been sedated or have <laughs> Alzheimer's and they end up waking, I could say waking up or coming out of it into a state that's called hyperlucidity. And they're capable now of full conversation with the people who are around them, the living people who are around them, but they still see these other apparitional figures as well. Um, just a quick story, my late investigative partner, um, who was a psychic and medium, Annette Martin, when she was dying in the hospital, um, she was with her husband was there. Uh, two of her students, her mediumship students were there as well. And she was heavily sedated because she was in a lot of pain. What Bruce, her husband, told me was that she woke up, she said hi to everybody, she started talking to them, and she looked over and, and the side, there was a hospice worker there too, and she started talking to her parents who had passed away many years before, and told Bruce and the others that they were there to help her transition, and apparently the two mediumship students also reported seeing apparitions as well, uh, where Annette was pointing. Then Annette said goodbye to Bruce, said to her parents, okay, I'm ready, and then she passed away. We talk about the big category, I think is the majority of what most people in the public are interested in, uh, is apparitions of the dead or post-mortem apparitions. And they can start from right at the moment of death and continue on from there. The majority of reported instances of sightings or perceptions, because it's not always visual, of an apparition of the dead seem to start right at the moment of death or can go, maybe can happen within on the average 24 to 72 hours. There are cases where the person doesn't appear to their friends or relatives or loved ones for a week and a half or so. <clears throat> I'm gonna finish up tonight with a personal experience in fact, which is more than a couple of days. And some few reported after that, but it's usually just one-time experiences with people. All right, so, all right. I, I mentioned in the abstract about common sense questions. So let's think about this. You don't have a body. You're a ghost, you're an apparition, you do not have a body. How do you see the world? If you are interacting with the living, how can you see the world? You don't have physical eyes that have light coming in and hitting the retina, you don't have an optic nerve. You, have no that, you don't have that kind of processing. You can't smell, you don't have the chemical structure because you don't have a physical nose. You can't speak, you can't move air without a voice box unless you're doing something with PK. How can you interact with us if you don't have a physical body to be perceived? How can they move things without a body? How can they show up on, on photos with no body to reflect light? And this is an important thing. Where do they get their clothes from? Um, not the question that I'm the only one who came up with this, but I wondered about this from being a little kid and watching some ghost TV shows, one in particular that I'll mention here in a moment, um, where the ghosts change clothes all the time. And think about that. Okay, if there's a, if a form that's there or some entity that's there, unless they have something in the physical environment to conjure up what may have been called ectoplasm, what they look like, what they sound like, if they can create a physical structure which can reflect light to be photographed, then shouldn't everyone see that? Shouldn't everyone hear the voice, or smell any body odor or perfume or cologne? If they move things, of course, and they're just an entity without a body, that is mind over matter, that's psychokinesis. Where do they get the clothes from? We'll get to that. All right, but it's all about perception. <clears throat> so the thing to remember is that this is not a situation where everyone may, may not experience the apparition the same way. We can have situations, and I've had situations reported to me where there are several people in an area 
and one or two people were seeing this figure and hear, perhaps one of them was actually hearing a voice being said, someone else only heard the voice, even though they're looking over to where the other people are seeing that apparition, someone else conceivably could smell something associated with that and others might feel a presence. And then some people have no experience whatsoever, all at the same time. So is this a telepathic process? It seems to be a psi perception process whether it's telepathic, mind to mind, or something else is hard to say. But if they were, if an apparition was material or some form of matter, then we should, if it's a function of the senses to see that ghost, but yet we can't have everybody experience it the same way or even close the same way. And recording devices don't routinely pick up what's going on at that point. There has to be something else going on. So as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, um, most apparitional experiences are short-term. They're one time, involve family, friends, loved ones. They rarely have, rarely have physical effects. They sometimes have ver verifiable information. Usually it's someone appears to a relative or friend or loved one, and that person didn't have any clue that there was anything wrong with that individual who's appearing as the apparition. And then they come to find out the person just died. So those kinds of situations are verifiable. And sometimes there's information given along the way. Um, I had a case called into us years ago when I was doing a regular radio show in New York where the woman claimed that her, her son who had just moved away and started a new job in Boston from New York, um, she was hearing his voice every day and trying to get his, her attention. And she was ignoring it because what she told us was, I'm a devout Catholic, I'm afraid of ghosts. We recommended uh, she talked to her priest who told her to say, to ask, what do you want? Um, he actually said, don't be afraid, just ask him. It's your son, ask him what he wants. And the information that was given to her was that there was an insurance policy with his new job where she was the beneficiary. And granted, they would have tracked her down, down the road, but he'd only been at this job for three weeks when he got into a fatal car accident. The Voice gave her the information for the insurance company, and this was a $250,000 policy. So this happened rel relatively quickly. And her son then said goodbye, and that was the last time she had the experience. Some few do take longer. Uh, sometimes they can go very long. You know, of course, we have cases where apparently the apparitions stick around for maybe even years or decades. I'm going to talk about a couple of them uh, towards the very end here. So they can involve strangers, people who didn't even know that there was a ghost there uh, or supposedly a ghost there. And this happens every so often. I think right now with the publicity of certain haunted places or ostensibly haunted places, because I don't think all of them are actually haunted except by the ghost hunters themselves perhaps, um, there's a lot of folklore out there. Uh, but um, you know what, what goes on in these circumstances is sometimes when somebody going to a relatively famous place, sometimes the historical locations will now play up their ghost story, uh, true or not. And that creates kind of contamination. If you say a stranger saw the ghost, well, that actually could be a suggestion because people were hoping to see one. On the rare side, we have some that have physical activity occurring, but it is generally after months or even years that happens. It's almost as if the ghost has to learn how to move something. And again, we call this apparitional PK or psychokinesis by the ghost. Uh, because it's not a poltergeist situation. It doesn't fall into that category. But again, this would be included under the poltergeist category at the beginning, at least uh, in the UK and other places as well. Um, I had uh, a very active place in the 80s here. It's actually it was active since the 70s, late the early 70s. Uh, I got involved in the mid 1980s. It's not as active anymore. Uh, we think the ghost has kind of either moved on or is bored. But People had been seeing this, this place called the Banta Inn. It's uh, about an hour and a half east of San Francisco in the town of Tracy. And the person who was seen was the bartender owner manager who died on location uh, very rapidly of a heart attack, according to the, the folks there in 1968. And people were seeing him as early as a week after, but it was restaurant patrons who didn't know him who would come through the bar area and comment on a guy playing poker, waving at them, just kind of saying hello, and then either disappearing or just kind of oddly behaving. They would mention this person to people in the restaurant or in the bar and ask about him. And there was nobody there. Uh, and eventually one the new owners, one of them was a Alameda County Sheriff's de deputy who did not believe in ghosts. 
he pulled together photographs. He made a mug book, essentially, photographs of this guy, Tony Gukin, and a bunch of his friends, all of the same age. And without fail, every time they had someone come in who remarked about this, they would start showing the mug book and people would always pick out Tony. Eventually, physical stuff started happening, and it was very similar to the things that he had done when he was alive, some of his normal habits, but playful also with um, certain patrons that came in. Uh, the owner told me that at one point, uh, he, apparently his activity scared off a hell's angel who couldn't believe that stuff was moving in front of him. And then, and the hell's angel was making fun of the idea of there was a ghost there. And there were two skeptics that the owner mentioned. She was there at the bar area when um, she saw, uh, when she was being kind of hassled by these two guys who claimed that the whole ghost story was made up and there was nothing to it a quarter in front of each of them flipped up on end. You know, they had been bought beers and they had their change in front of them. So imagine a quarter that's flat on the bar, flipping up and balancing on its edge. Apparently that was enough to send them yelling and screaming out of the bar. It freaked them out, leaving everyone else there laughing at them. Also leaving their change on the bar was good for the bartender. All right, so what's going on? You got an apparition. You're, you are the apparition. You have passed away. You don't have a body anymore. You're still sticking around here for whatever reason. How are you seeing? How are you perceiving the world? Well, you would perceive that without senses. So you would be perceiving the world directly. And that's our definition of extrasensory perception. It is information coming without the use of the normal senses. So you're perceiving the world directly with ESP. And then how people might perceive them seems to be um, somehow how you as the apparition think of yourself is, I, I, for better, one of a better word, it's broadcast. And people, certain people pick up on, I guess, on different frequent, different channels. They're picking up visual, auditory, or various perceptual, perceptual channels. They're picking up the information, again, psychically, and they have an image or sound or something appearing in their own mind. So it becomes part of your perceptions as the witness. Uh, this actually relates to why they have clothing on as well, right? And that is the fact that without, with rare exception, if you are in Western society or even a lot of East, most Eastern societies, most people, if you picture yourself, if you're capable of visualization, which granted there are people, some people who cannot come up with a visualization of, of anything. But if you can picture yourself, it is unlikely you are picking, you're picturing yourself naked or in the nude, unless you are living at a nudist colony or something, or just think very highly of yourself. So we think of ourselves with clothing on. We also think of ourselves looking often healthier, maybe um, better fit, my case possibly with more hair, than we actually do look. So there is that kind of self-image that is projected out there. And if you change your self-image, it seems that perhaps other people might see you differently. So what do they look like? Well, most people report apparitions as looking human. They look often solid and three-dimensional. It's, it's almost never that they're two-dimensional. Clothed, often only seen from uh, the top of the head down to above, right above or below the knees. Um, I used to do surveys of college students, large audiences sometimes when I did college lectures. And it was about 5% of the folks who thought of themselves all the way down to their feet. And the majority of those, when I asked the next question, all said yes. And the, the next question was, how many of you who think of yourselves, who picture yourself all the way down to your feet buy a lot of shoes? So it just depends on your self-image. And of course, in those images that people see when someone has just died, or in longer term situations, they look younger and healthier than they were when they were last alive. Unlike some of the uh, imagery that comes in certain movies where the damage kind of comes along with them if they died in an accident. So this is a picture from an old TV show from the 50s called Topper. Uh, the two ghosts are George and Marion Kirby. They died in a uh, skiing incident with an avalanche. Oh, and also the St. Bernard who tried to rescue them died, the dog Neil. And they were changing their clothes regularly. They also drank a lot. Spirits drinking spirits. A little PK thing happened in the show. This is, uh, to me, one of the best movies uh, on apparitions and ghosts, although there is a very dramatic piece that was added to this. Uh, that's Patrick Swayze in the movie Ghost. 
uh, which, uh, for which Whip Whippy Goldberg won a Best Supporting Actress role uh, in that, an Oscar for that. And what's interesting about this film is how much that Bruce Joel Friedman actually based some of the activity and behavior of the ghost and the medium for that matter, uh, Whoopi Goldberg playing the medium on some genuine information in parapsychology. And I was very happy to learn a few years after that it was a book by Scott Rogo, D. Scott Rogo that he used and my first book, ESP Hauntings and Poltergeists. The one thing that's a little different here is that people rarely ever report um, a bad guy's ghost or spirit or soul being dragged into the underworld by shadowy entities. That's something that they made very dramatically in the film. It, it made the film a lot more interesting. He had to learn how to move things, by the way. So if you want an example of, of that, that's a this is a great movie for that. All right, so in some of our cases, what's going on? You've got things moving, appearing in photos, you have on audio recordings, maybe not all the same. Again, that's the apparition technically, if they're physically interacting with the environment without a body, this would be mind over matter. Of course, we have to eliminate all the other potential non-paranormal explanations. Just remember, and this is from Charlie Tart, dying does not significantly improve your IQ. So asking a ghost to tell the future or to give you answers to things, unless they already knew the answers, apparently they're not going to get it. Give you that. There are different ideas of what an apparition might be made of or my apparition might be. Uh, includes spirit, you know, as the word spirit is used. The mediums I work with over the um, have worked with over the years from the Forever Family Foundation, as well as others I have worked with, would often distinguish the word ghost from spirit. They would use spirit for those folks whose consciousness has transitioned to the other side or the next step, if you want to call it that. Whereas they use the word ghost for someone who is still sticking around here, and we typically uh, use apparition for that. But apparition and ghost in that context can be kind of played with interchangeably. But when it comes right down to it, there it's all consciousness. Uh, for some people, maybe this is simply an image in someone else's mind, a living person's image that's being transmitted to other people, a telepathic hallucination. Of course, it could be imagination. It could be something wrong with your brain causing you to see that. It also could be place memory, the idea of the physical environment's providing you with an image of someone who is not interactive in that case. People ask, what is the apparition made of? Well, energy, but then we don't have no idea what kind of energy. We do know, pretty sure, like 99.9999% that they're not electromagnetic in nature. There's a number of reasons why. Uh, the word ectoplasm, which was coined by Charles Roche in the 19th century, especially in relation to something that was going on with physical mediumship in the seance room, uh, ecto, spirit, plasm, matter. Different than what ghost hunters often use that term for, um, but they don't seem to be a form of matter for a number of reasons. People have often, in some cultures, will call them a shade or shadow of the firm form person. So not actually their consciousness, but some form of leftover recording, which can still interact. And maybe something else, not matter or energy. Um, in a great discussion in a Dr. Solar comic book a few years ago, Jim Shooter, who among other things is the creator of the Legion of Superheroes, um, was expressing how a being, how someone, a physicist who was trapped in a nuclear reactor got converted into energy and then was able to mentally, his consciousness was able to bring back his physical body. They talked about consciousness being possibly a particle, a quantum particle field that was generated by the brain when alive, but can be coherent after the brain is dead. Science fiction provides us with a lot of really interesting ideas about consciousness and about ghosts and things very different than horror films and horror novels. Why are they still here? You know, I always get asked that question. Well, depending on who you ask, you'll find, uh, to ask different psychics and mediums, you'll get any number of these different explanations. If you uh, go and look in the writings of somebody like Hans Holzer, it'll be the first one. They don't know they're dead. Um, if you look at the actual cases where there's been communication, whether with the witnesses or a psychic or medium, it's all of these potentially. They don't know they're dead sometimes. I, I tend to think that this is not the case. My guess is that they are in denial that they're dead, not that they don't know that they're dead. I think the fact that no, nobody can see them or most people can't see them should give them a clue. The unfinished business we hear about in ghost stories is more about, it seems, more about them needing to make sure their family is okay or making sure or that there's something that 
they need to observe or deal with, uh, but not directly. It's more information they need to find. And so much of this is about families in grief not letting go of their deceased loved one, and they're sticking around to make sure the family's okay. Sometimes they, they claim that they're not ready to go, and sometimes that's because of fear. Uh, that's the afraid of what's next. Uh, case I'll talk about here had that definitely connected to it. They may have an attachment to family and property, depending on the culture that they're dealing with. Um, they may have been really invested in building their house and they don't want to leave and they, they don't want anybody else to be in that house at that point. You know, there's the folklore around the world in a ghost story where the person is cursed to roam the earth until something happens. We don't really find that unless the people somehow believe that. And one of the things I should mention is, uh, because this comes up quite a bit, <clears throat> Can they move around? I mean, why are they in one place? And the, there are plenty of cases that indicate that that apparition can either move around with people if they kind of want to follow their family members around, or they can just simply go wherever they want. Now, we have cases where the apparition has appeared in multiple places, not all at once, but has gone beyond that one structure that they started out in. And by the way, they tend to go back, we tend to go back to places we had, at least in the West, we had positive associations with in life. So if Cheers was a real bar and Norm and Cliff were the, the regulars, my guess would be, my speculation would be if they died, they would just go to Cheers and haunt that place. They wouldn't go to their homes or someplace else because that's where they hung out for the most part. That's one reason we seem to find a lot of bars and restaurants and hotels and places like that, fun places that uh, people hang out as apparitions. But you know, there are likely some other factors like environmental factors. Otherwise, I think, personally, I think, that we'd have a lot more apparitions if that was the case. If it wasn't some other factor in here. You know, are they good? Are they evil? There's folklore that somebody dies, you know, that all ghosts are evil. You hear that. And sometimes that's because of religious dogma. Uh, sometimes it's because of mythology. Sometimes because people had a bad experience with somebody. But they're people, they seem to be. And here we are dealing with, with the exception of pet ghosts, we are dealing with apparitions of people who were alive for the most part. All right. We don't find that people change their personality or outlook on life, you know, from good to evil, just because they die. It doesn't seem to happen. Now, that doesn't mean that somebody who was a bully in life suddenly becomes a goody two shoes after after death or vice versa. So people, the behavior of apparitions seem to connect back to who they were when they were living people. There are not many truly evil people in the world. Certainly, we haven't seen any uh, any um, real examples of sociopaths who come, who stick around as apparitions. So we don't think that there's any of that going on. Uh, people do report non-human entities. Uh, in a small number of those percentage of those cases of poltergeist activity, there are non-human figures that are seen that seem to directly connect back to the psychology of the living agent of the poltergeist agent, the person who seems to be at the epicenter of the events. And dealing with the phenomena, again, working with that living agent in a number of different ways, psychologically and otherwise, that non-human form is gone because it's connected directly to the unconscious of that individual. The question comes up, are they able to harm people or not? Um, I think that what we've seen is it tends to be less about PK and more about that information that they're presenting. So if somebody intended for you to trip um, maybe they couldn't physically push you, but they might give you the idea that you're tripping. Um, I've been, one of the cases I've been on, which I'll talk about here in a few minutes, the USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum, I have had my arm squeezed, and I'm pretty sure I wasn't physically squeezed, my arm squeezed, and my, I had my back padded when I helped a, a kid out of fear of seeing one of the apparitions there. And there was a cameraman behind me, and I had a very loose windbreaker on, he did not see my, my windbreaker move at all. So either the ghost kind of passed through and patted me directly on my skin, which it didn't feel like. It felt like it came through my clothes. Or the apparition gave me the idea, the perception that that's what happened. All right, are we dealing with consciousness, place memory? Is it neither or both? So again, we have to, when people are seeing figures or hearing voices or footsteps, we have to find out really what we're dealing with if we're going to go to a next step and study what's happening and even help the folks involved. We look at that interactivity here as much as possible. And how we do that is interviewing 
people, the witnesses, possibly psychics and mediums, on the behavior of the phenomena, on the pattern of activity, if there is any, because apparitions tend to not to have much of a pattern, just like most humans don't have much of a pattern unless they have OCD. Um, I, I guess we could have that happen. And then what do the witnesses think? Uh, what do the psychics and mediums think? You know, so we bring it all together, all the human perception. I'm not talking about equipment here because the fact is there is no piece of equipment other than living beings that seem to be able to absolutely detect any of this. We do have an issue, of course, within the field uh, of whether or not these are indications of what's called survival size. So does the apparition, is there an apparition, a consciousness that has psychic functioning that can perceive and interact with the world? Or is it all from us, us living folks? Is it coming from the body? You know, whose psi is it? Is there even a discarded entity there? Certainly in the haunting cases, we don't think so because there's no interactivity, no indication of consciousness. That is all somatic side, it seems. But with the apparition cases, because we have both happening, we have both sides of that coin. Now there is a, a an approach, the super psi approach. Super psi is taking psi to a next level and, and using it, you know, Un, almost unlimited psychic ability of a living person to explain things like apparitions, mediumship, um, reincarnation cases with children who remember previous lives. And, and a lot of it, to my mind, is a stretch. But the fact is, it seems to, to relate, and it, it, the split seems to be in philosophy about consciousness. Materialists would go more towards the super psi approach. People who might be dualists or, or think that consciousness is more than brain would go towards... Uh, possibly towards the apparitional approach. So in this case with super psi, that the apparition is really that imprint. It's that haunting. But as people have experiences of the haunting, their own perceptions get added to the story. And the next people coming along can actually pick up on the additions as well as the original imprint. The skeptical viewpoint, of course, is that these are false conclusions for perceptions, uh, if they're hallucinations, it's wishful thinking, their environmental effects, which leads to the false conclusions, or it's absolute fraud. Um, of course, there's also the idea of gullibility. You know, uh, skeptics tend to, to think that. So just to sum this up, uh, as I get into the cases and leave plenty of time for Q&A, when you perceive an apparition. So I, I kind of made this list uh, a few years ago of all the possible things, and this is not everything either. <laughs> Um, I think it's important to, um, I didn't include so much fraud in here, uh, which is always a possibility. I am a mentalist, former magician. There are things we can do with illusion and suggestion that would make somebody think there's something going on. So if you see a figure perceived visually, that could be a real person. You know, um, I, I, People have sent me photographs sometimes say, I'm pretty sure this person was not in the background. Well, pretty sure it's not the same as, you know, it's taken outside. There actually could have been a person like photobombing in there. It's a real person. It's a place memory, a haunting, because it's not interactive. Maybe an apparition of the dead. Perhaps an apparition of the living, a psychic perception of someone else, a trick of memory that can cause us to have um, a little glitch that could make us remember that we have, think we, we saw an apparition. Could be a trick of perception, especially if it's not fully a human person. It can be a blur caused by the shadows out of the corner of your eye, which conceivably could be caused by infrasound, provided that there is a 18, 19 hertz sound wave hitting your eyeball, which can vibrate your eyes. Or if your eyes are really tired, that can happen too. Or it's an, Im an image caused by phantoms of the brain. There's something going on neurologically. The sound can be a real sound that you are misinterpreting. This happens all the time. In any sort of ghost hunting, when you have the lights turned off, um, it does, you know, turning off the lights and cutting out your sense of sight does not necessarily and does not dramatically improve your sense of hearing. Maybe if that was all your life, but there have been enough studies that show that people cannot determine, for quite often cannot determine where a sound is coming from or what it is when they are cut off from sight and especially in a darkened room in another environment. Could be place memory or haunting, could be an apparition of the dead. Yes, you're getting a sound instead or a voice instead of a visual. Apparition of the living, same thing. Perception, trick of memory. All of these are, are very similar in many respects. The smell, because there are olfactory only apparitions. Uh, could be a real smell. 
and it, it probably shouldn't be floating around and moving around. That's the one thing that will help you determine if it's apparitional very, very much so that more than an actual smell, but could be place memory. And that could have moved around the way the imprint was set up. The dead, the living, perception, trick of memory. There's a lot of repeating here because these things can come through in any number of different sensory ways into our perceptions. The presence, it could be a misinterpretation of something going on in your body. Again, we have all the other ones as well. There can be a kinesthetic sensation caused by sound. Again, low frequency sound. Think about um, any of the times that you might've been in your car at a stoplight and somebody pulls up next to you in a car and they have their music blaring really loud and they have the bass cranked up to the point where not only does their car shake, but your car shakes and you shake. That low frequency, that bass can do that as well. Could be again, something caused by the brain. Feeling of being touched. Uh, not, again, we're dealing with all the same things here each way, but it also could be maybe PK or telepathic impression, living person, same thing. We're not quite sure about that piece of it at this point. It does not seem that apparitions can actually do stuff to us directly with PK. But that also could depend on your receptivity. Um, it also, you know, there are cases where people have been choked or scratched. And I, I had a case where a person actually had bruise marks appearing, turned out to be actually a poltergeist case. She was causing it to her own body. Uh, we have some very good reason why that happened. But this was a psychosomatic reaction. It, it's still psychokinesis, still mind over matter, but it was mind over matter caused by her own consciousness on her own body. So ultimately we look at ghosts as being interactive and do interactions equal survival of consciousness? Well, what is consciousness? So when we talk about apparitions as evidence for survival, we want apparitions that provide us with information that the witnesses could not have known, the psychics or medium could not have known, and something that indicates that there's actually a person there because they can also get information from the environment. So we want some interactive stuff. We want definitely with that interactivity. We, it's better if we have multiple witness experiences at the same time and over time. Like when I mentioned before, the Banta Inn, people seeing Tony Gukin in different places in the restaurant, doing different activity, recognizing them, waving at them, but always able to pick out the right guy from a mug book, from a, a lineup more or less. The best cases have multiple sightings multiple witnesses, singly and together, clear indication of interactivity, and even the witnesses sense or can, can tell that that entity is aware of them and, and self-aware. That we bring in multiple sensors, psychic practitioners with same information or similar information coming through. That we have multiple, excuse me, my Alexa just went off. Um, that we have multiple encounters over time, especially from strangers with, with no or limited knowledge that fit together. That we have the verifiable and previously unknown information communicated. I'm sorry about my Alexa, just talking a little too much here. All right, so again, we're looking at verifiable information that's communicated. And sometimes what's really interesting is it's, it might be hard to prove everything, I had one case, um, one of my longer term cases, where we got information about something that had happened at that location back in its early days, uh, the early days of the restaurant, and there were no records of it whatsoever. In fact, there was no records of much of anything on that part of the California coast um, of an illegal nature that had gone on in the area of the restaurant. But it was later confirmed by someone at another case whose, whose father had worked for the state of California and had told him all these stories about the illegal activity right around that location. Let's remember that ghosts are people too. Um, and that is, of course, if there are indications of survival of consciousness. To me, all of this does say yes. Um, all of these points, especially the multiple witnesses, the information that comes through, the interactivity, the reaction that happens, that does suggest consciousness survives death. All right, so two cases, or actually three real quick. <clears throat> This case is written up extensively in Leslie Kane's book, uh, Surviving Death. So it's in the chapter on interactive apparitions. If you want to read deeply about this case, that's the best place to get it. I have a little bit of that in one in my ghost hunting book as well. 
but that's where you'll find it. This was a case that came to us uh, at JFK University when we had our graduate parapsychology program. I'm gonna give you the short form here since we're, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for questions, but there were four family members, three, a couple, a couple, and they're, when they first moved in, a 10 and a half year old son, actually all close to 11 years old. Um, and then the woman's mother, Pat's mother would help them move in. And as Pat, the mother came to find out, her husband, her mother, and her son had all seen the same apparition that she had seen. She saw this apparition when they first started moving in and actually on a fairly regular basis, like every week, but not on the same day or the same time downstairs, usually in the living room, which when she was there, she found out that uh, because her son had mentioned something to her a year and a half after they moved into this fairly old Victorian for the Bay Area, built in 1917, the owner, uh, previous owner had been born there, lived here her entire life, died in a hospital of cancer, not in the house, just very important, about a, over a year before they moved in. They actually bought the house in an estate sale because the woman's uh, beneficiary, the only person in the family still alive was 92 or 90 at that time and living in an assisted living facility. They bought it through an attorney. They never got a chance to talk to that previous, um, the cousin of the previous owner. So one day her, the son, uh, Chris started talking about um, some things in the house because they bought antiques and an antique doll collection and a lot of things that had previously been owned by Lois, the previous owner. They had very little information about her. Um, they, uh, Pat had gone through the house looking for um, any anything she could find in the attic everywhere, any records, nothing that, that she found about any of these, these things. And the boy started talking about some of the porcelain dolls, leading Pat to ask, how did you find out? And him saying, oh, you know, Lois, the ghost that you dad and grandma are seeing but aren't talking about. That's how I know. Come to find out that he had been in daily communication with the ghost since they moved in. Um, he was talking to her. Um, she apparently helped him with his homework and his grades had, had in fact gotten better, which is interesting. Uh, he provided details about the house itself. The family was very curious and she actually called to, to make sure that as he's growing up, he was 12 and a half, you know, a little over 12 years old. Is he going to be a normal teenager if he's talking to a ghost every day? We did have a, a child psychologist speak with him who was impressed by the maturity level of this kid. Uh, it was a psychologist who did not believe in ghosts, but basically said there is nothing wrong with this kid and that, you know, I wouldn't, even though I don't believe in ghosts, I wouldn't say to him, Lois doesn't exist because that could actually screw him up. So when we got there, um, I had a couple of folks from JFK come with me uh, and we were taken around the house by Chris and the mother and the grandmother. The husband was out of town. I did talk to him separately. Uh, they all had seen this woman, an older woman, not always wearing the same clothing, but they all described the same person. Chris stated that Lois sometimes appeared as, as, as an older woman, the way apparently she looked her age when she got terminal cancer and passed away. But she was wearing different clothing. She sometimes showed up at different ages. And when we asked why that was, and he, he, he kind of listened to what Lois was telling him, and he related that Lois said that was how she felt that day as a younger woman or as a teenager or as a kid. So that's what he, she was putting out there. That's how she thought of herself. The same with the clothes. She changed her clothes because she could, she could think of herself differently. The boy provided us details from Lois about the house and its history, about family events that happened in the house. And we, had a, we were thinking, how are we gonna prove, you know, confirm this? He also provided us with a lot of bits about history of the town of Livermore, but frankly, I didn't count any of that because Chris could have read that in the library. So um, I did get information through Chris enough to contact, to find and contact the one living relative of Lois, who was very happy to talk to me when he heard that Lois was still around because by this time he was 92 and thinking, well, hey, if Lois can stick around, maybe I can too. Lois told Chris that the reason, and then Chris told us that the reason she was around was because she wasn't terribly religious and didn't know if heaven or hell existed and figured why take a chance. So when she was in the process of dying, this is what he's telling us. When she was dying in the hospital, she kept thinking, I just want to go home. You know, kind of like the Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. And the next thing she knew after letting go, as she put it, 
was she was in the in the living room of her home and she wanted to wait till the next people moved in. If she liked them, she would stay and she did. Um, no fear in this circumstance. Um, we had a lot of verifiable information. The guy I talked to, the cousin, verified all the family stories. And in fact, when I started some of the family stories, he finished them. I didn't even have to finish my notes. It was very, very interesting and truly an example of an interactive apparition. I followed up for many years afterwards. The uh, last time I talked to him was about 2004. And as Chris grew up, she was active. Lois was active in his life and apparently even giving him good advice on how to deal with girls. So a very practical thing in many respects. But again, here was a situation where the family was very curious. And when we got to ask Lois, you know, the questions like, why are you here? And also, what are you? I mean, do you have a body? Her response was no, as far as she knew she, this was an interesting thing. This is 85 at this point when we're having this interview. And um, I am a big Star Trek fan. And apparently Lois was too, because the response Chris gave us was she thought of herself like a ball of energy, like some of those beings in Star Trek. And she was actually, as I asked follow-up questions, she was referring to an episode of Star Trek called Errand of Mercy, where these highly advanced, evolved, consciousness-only beings projected an image of themselves as humanoids to the humans and the Klingons in that, and then eventually revealed themselves as just balls of energy. All right, the other case I just thought I'd talk about just for a couple of minutes here is the USS Hornet Aircraft Carrier Museum in Alameda, California. Um, this was the ship, which is, of course, well known now because of television. Uh, I was actually brought on the ship um, to look at the situation after a psychic who had been working with a couple of people on the board. Uh, she was a docent. She was working with them. She talked to me about a poltergeist case she had. We kind of worked together and she had a strong science background. So she wanted to make sure that whatever I did coming in would be coming from the field of parapsychology and not just folklore. And so I was brought in uh, in late eight, 1998. This is after the ship opened as a museum uh, and then continued in doing investigation and a lot of interview work uh, for a couple of years over time and just kind of looking into this. And also helping the, the board uh, promote the ship as haunted in order to bring more people to the museum. So we kind of opened that up as well. The ship had not been docked in Alameda. It was brought down from the Bremerton shipyards where it was slated to be scrapped for $6 a ton. Uh, it was brought down to its original base, home base during World War II in Alameda, the Alameda Air Base, uh, during its closing ceremonies. There was a foundation that was formed to save the ship as a historical site because it was the lead ship in the Pacific Fleet from 1943, the end of 1943 to the end of the world of World War II. It is the ship that picked up Apollo 11 and 12 also in 1969. So they developed this museum, but as they were working on the museum, they had to actually clean up the ship. A lot of lead paint and asbestos had to be cleaned out. A lot of painting had to be done, scraping lead paint and scraping. So one of the first things, there are three initial witnesses who really had very quality experiences. Keith Ledoux ended up being a volunteer who lived aboard the ship uh, with another volunteer, had the first reported experience with his colleague, Jim Yushenkoff. Alan McCain, uh, when I was there, was the curator of the Hornet Museum, former Navy SEAL, didn't necessarily believe in ghosts, uh, said he didn't know what he experienced, but here's what it, what it was. Bob Rogers, former commander in the US Coast Guard, um, had had several experiences as well. McCain's experience involved another witness who saw a man in officer khakis after hours at a time when there were only going to be five people aboard the ship, one security guy and four others, uh, come up a ladder into the command and control center, look at them, nod at them, so acknowledge them, and then took off and disappeared. Bob Rogers had experiences in the engine room, which was a closed area, following someone down a ladder. There's a number of different pieces we have. We actually have video interviews with all of these folks. And Keith Ledoux's experience with Jim Yushinkoff was in, was in the forecastle or forecastle of the ship, the front of the ship, which is fully enclosed. Uh, and they were scraping and painting away. Those anchor chain links, by the way, are about this big. So it's a huge, a huge thing with the anchors. Uh, there is a, that, that hatchway up there on the catwalk goes to um, some quarters for sailors who could stay there, uh, who were actually bunked there during certain times of the ship's ship being in service. <clears throat> 
again, there's uh, just volunteers in the ship at this point who are cleaning up the ship. Um, no one from the Navy was there, but, and this is a recreation. At one point, they felt like somebody was looking at them. They look up, there's a there's actually one sailor looking down on them, guy and sailors. And then they look around on the on different part of the catwalk and there's a guy in officer's khakis, a non-commissioned officer actually. And the officer, the non-commissioned officer is looking around, uh, the sailors, sailor as well, and the officer it kind of waves at them and then salutes them. And then he and the sailor disappeared. So that was one of the first experiences. Over time, Keith was also often central to a lot of the experiences he, because he was on the ship all the time, Jim as well, where they were with other people, many other people that actually saw these various apparitions. Uh, that's Stash Murray on the left, who was the psychic who brought me aboard, Keith Ledoux in the middle. Uh, Daphne was a uh, receptionist for the uh, foundation who had her own experiences of being hugged inappropriately by a sailor, uh, at which point Sasha and I, unbeknownst to Daphne, um, tracked down the, according to Stash, the ghost of Rear Admiral Jocko Clark, who was a commander aboard the ship when it was in, in service, and told him about the situation. Stash, Stash told the apparition about him. Uh, about the sailor and the next day we get a call I got a call from Daphne saying I don't know what you did but he's staying about 100 feet away from him so apparently there was a chain of command uh, on the ship Bob Rogers is there on the right one of the common things that people heard which we think probably was place memory because there were several spots on the ship where we had repeating patterns this is a ladder to an, uh, to an officer's quarters in the rear of the ship and occasionally people would report hearing, and again, multiple witnesses hearing footsteps coming down the ladder, but they wouldn't see anything. In the ladies room, ladies head, it was as it's called, that's Bob Rogers and my colleague, David Richardson, who was our videographer and investiga co-investigator. Uh, we were told that once they opened as a museum, women would come out of this area. Now, when the ship was in service, there was no ladies room. There were no women on the ship, unless they be, there were journalists who were visiting for the Apollo 11 and 12 piece. So according to women, occasionally would be hearing the sounds of those chains rattling above, but the chains didn't move. This was an engine repair shop and they would hear sounds of people working on motors and things like that. They would look in the mirror and occasionally would see a guy walking behind them, stopping, turning and looking at them. They could see him in the mirror, but they couldn't see him when they turned around. And he's standing there with his hands on his hips, just shaking his head, like what are women doing out by the ship? But the real reason we were going in there is because many women reported actually getting pinched on the rear, being goosed by some of these apparitions, something that happened in other parts of the ship as well. The medical bay, when that opened to the public, uh, we had already gotten experiences from the docents and from the volunteers working to clean it up. This was an area that felt weird and bad. There are parts of the medical bay where people were dying that just has a bad feeling to it, impression there. But there was a figure seen occasionally in the chief medical offices, officer's office. And Annette and I, Annette started communicating with him, uh, Annette Martin, my, my partner way back when uh, for investigations. Uh, and we were act actually able to ask him to play with various physical devices and on command, unless it was Annette doing it unconsciously, on command we had some, re on request I should say. We had Bernie actually active with us. Docents reported that once they opened up the couple of the conference rooms, cleaned it up, opened it up, this was an officer's conference room. Uh, one of the docents, um, actually two of them told me this separately, but this one guy, Bob, told me that uh, they would he'd be taking a tour group on and they're coming in through one of the hatchways. They're going to go through the conference room to that door to go to continue on through the ship. And every once in a while, he'd open the door and he'd see officers sitting there and all their heads would swivel to him, opening the door. And the commanding officer at the end and would just kind of give him a wave and he would know to kind of back out because apparently the ghosts were having a meeting. This is the um, admiral's quarters, a visiting admiral would visit, would come every once in a while, or captain's quarters as well. Uh, this is the nicest quarters on the ship. And uh, Annette and others had seen uh, someone who was identified from photographs as Jocko Clark, again, a commander during the ship during World War II, eventually became a rear admiral, died in, civ out in civilian life after retiring. So he did not die anywhere near the ship. In fact, most of the apparitions 
that have been seen, the communications that witnesses have gotten, the psychics, and I've worked with multiple psychics and mediums on this, and the couple that have been identified from photographs did not die aboard the ship. And that's Annette having a communication with Jocko Clark. And that is Rear Admiral Jocko Clark, who was is the person that everybody goes to if they have a problem with any of the other apparitions. Uh, according to witness descriptions, there are probably somewhere over 50 separate apparitions that have interacted with people, um, including a couple of the docents who died after the ship opened as a museum. People have told me that they, they showed back up. Case of multiple sightings over time, multiple witnesses singling together, interactivity, multiple psychics with the same information, and we held stuff back sometimes. And again, there's this general camarader camaraderie between the living and the dead. The people working aboard the ship, they love having these guys there. And they, the general feeling, and this is what we've heard from psychics also, is that they're there to make sure the ship stays open as a museum. And lastly, a personal encounter, all right? Not as interactive perhaps, but something I think very valid as well. Uh, that is Martin Caden. He was a science and science fiction writer. Uh, he wrote the book Cyborg, which became The Six Million Dollar Man. He was an aviation expert. He was a, a con consultant to NASA. In fact, there were several times I was visiting him in Cocoa Beach when uh, he'd get a phone call from the PR office at NASA asking him a question about NASA history because he was the only person who knew the entire history of all the people um, who worked on various projects and everything that had gone on there in a real kind of a really amazing memory. Uh, so he, he uh, I worked with him uh, I met him in 92 and we worked together quite a bit. He was capable of psychokinesis himself under controlled conditions, studied by a number of folks, including guys from NASA. Um, but what was really interesting is, um, and unfortunate was he was misdiagnosed with thyroid cancer. He was given a different diagnosis. And by the time it was too late to treat it, because it's a very treatable cancer, um, it was throughout his body. He, and this is force of will. Um, he eventually went to the Mayo Clinic they gave him eight weeks to live. His response to them was to tell them off and that they had no right giving him an expiration date. And he died about a year and a half later. And from what I understand, according to his wife, every week after that eight weeks, he would call these doctors at the Mayo Clinic and curse them out, tell them he was still present. He also kiddingly said to me that, you know, when I die, I'm going to come back and haunt you, our back. So honestly, this was a situation when I found out from his wife that he passed away in hospice. Uh, that, he was, that I would see him, that I would experience him. And nothing, nothing for several days, nothing for a week, nothing for more than a week. And then one day, a week and a half after he passed away, I'm driving to the Oakland airport down a major freeway here, going through Oakland uh, in my car that was only a couple months old, so it still smelled new. No one smoked whatsoever in my car. You can see he's got a, a cigar in his mouth there. My car filled up with the smell of cigar smoke. And I felt a presence sitting next to me. So I said my goodbyes. I, I recognized the smell of that cigar smoke. It was him as far as my perceptions were concerned. I got up, I was flying up to Portland, Oregon. I got to Portland. I picked up the phone. I called a pilot friend of Marty's who I'd met a number of times in Florida. Before I could say anything other than hi, Bob, he said, Lloyd, I can't believe you're calling me. You must be psychic. And of course I said, Yeah, of course I am. Why do you think that? He said, Well, I was going to call you and I was flying my Cessna this morning. Now I have to stop and say for a second that my experience happened just around, it happened like I think one minute after 7 a.m. Pacific time, which is 10 a.m. Eastern time. So Bob says, I'm flying my Cessna up here in New Jersey and around 10, 10 a.m. my cockpit fills up with the smell of stinky cigar smoke. And I swear to God, he was here with me in the, in the cockpit. And I said my goodbyes because I, I knew I had to do that. And then it was gone. And that's not the best part. I just got off the phone with John Tracy, who was a test pilot they knew in, Flo in Florida, good friend of Marty's. And apparently at 10.20 a.m., Tracy flying his aircraft alone had the same experience. Over the next couple of weeks, I told Bob my experience, and over the next couple of weeks, apparently, and Bob stopped counting, 25 pilots or other people who knew Marty really well, either alone in a car or alone in a plane when they were flying, had the same experience we did. So this is a circumstance where something of Caden was kind of bouncing around from place to place. Several of the experiences happened before mine and Bob's. 
um, we apparently were low down on the list. And that's Marty. And my favorite quote from him happened during a TV show that we were doing together. It shouldn't be happening, but it is. And that's what we're talking about here. Modern, you know, science tells us, mainstream science says this stuff doesn't exist. But people have these experiences, have had these experiences for thousands of years. So many in the historical record and so many in the records of our field, even outside our field. And to say that they are not happening is ridiculous. To not study them is not scientific. It may not be that apparitions are what we think they are, but we probably won't really get there until we understand what consciousness is in general. It's my contact information, and I guess we can take questions. Sorry if I went a little bit over the hour. You could go on forever. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> We're having uh, a good time here. Yeah. Anybody people... have? Well, Morgan has a question. Does anybody else have a question? Yes. Okay, we're right. piling them up there. Okay, so I'm going to stop. You're in I'm going to stop. You're in I'm going to stop here. I am just going to stop sharing so I can see everybody. And so, um, okay. do do a squeak, quick screen grab if you need the contact information. Feel free to email me. Do connect with the Rhine Center. Take a look at our courses. Uh, I'm teaching teaching a course actually starting in May with Kenny Biddle from the Skeptic side, where it's going to be the skeptical approach to parapsychology. We've done this once before. Uh, as well as an intro to parapsychology class and uh, how to develop your intuition class. And please do support the Forever Family Foundation. You can join for free. So let me go ahead and stop sharing. Okay. Okay, I definitely have a question. I have to pick your brain on something actually. Okay. Uh, so so I've, I've got the next season of, uh, of uh, Supernatural Circumstances. Stay as close to you, as you can to your, your mic, sure. Morgan. Um, so Sorry. What, I, what I was, what I was wondering, because I've been doing a deep dive on, do you remember the, the Sally case, the, the Heartland ghost in Kansas? Uh, yeah. You have the one that Carrie Gaynor did for sightings. Yeah. 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 And so I've like, I've been going back over that one and I know like there's, there was a lot of, uh, back and forth between some of the investigators there whether that was something that was was strictly psychokinetic whether because tony i don't know if you remember the the, the details but tony was the husband bit, yeah. yeah he was getting scratched and and cut up and they, and they were recording it on film like there was no outward signs of hoaxing or or anything like that um so yeah i would just i would just be curious to know like i know they they firmly felt that there was a it, that there was a disincarnate entity that they were communicating with that they, they, they had a they had a very strong narrative going on that this was this little girl and of course none of the events matched the fact that it was a little girl because the there were fires blowing up all over the house and and whatever i was just wondering what what was your what would be your take on on that case well i have a couple things you know first of all it, if you want, I can try to hook you up with Kerry Gaynor because he would be the person to talk to about this. Yeah, uh, no, I, I know, I know, Kerry. I haven't talked yeah. to him in, in a while, you, but I thought since connect, we're here, <laughs> yeah, you should connect with him. I, one thing I'll say is that this was presented on television. Yeah, <clears throat> and the narrative was, you know, there were certain things that were emphasis, emphasized on the narrative that were not actually going on. Yeah, I've got her book, um, and I've been yeah. sort of piecing through her book as well, just to like get the the down low of <laughs> well, I, I, <laughs> I do know perception. I do know that Carrie did catch um, the husband scratching himself a couple of times. Yeah. Um, but we do know that also in poltergeist cases, there is a factor of imitative fraud that happens in cases. And that certainly could happen in other kinds of cases as well to keep the narrative going more or less or to blame it, blame something on somebody else. In this yeah. case, a visible entity. Um, you know, my impression talking to Carrie so far, because we haven't talked about that case in years, yeah. Uh, watching that on TV and then also taking carry, I mean, it seemed like it might have been um, the RSPK, you know, poltergeist case in that sense. Um, and it's not without, you know, it doesn't, it's not out of the question that they wouldn't get answers to questions they ask if it's coming from somebody's unconscious also. Sure. Uh, the, the, pro the issue with the scratching that appeared on people's skins, there's an old wrestler's trick of scratching the surface of the skin and then and and then tensing up your muscles and then it starts bleeding. Right. So that was one of the things that um, I think Carrie was looking at is how much of this was actually happening right then, how much of it might have happened if he scratched himself before that. Now, that's yeah. also to say that there are plenty of cases where definitely scratches appeared on people. 
uh, or sure. Bruce or something like that. But the question then is, is this coming from an outside force or is this coming from within themselves? Because we do know, um, I mean, I, I there are those circumstances where it it clearly is something, I hate to use the word psychosomatic, but that's what it is. Yeah, 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 it, yeah. It's a nocebo effect. It's a physical nocebo effect, not a placebo effect in that sense. Yeah, so, no, and that makes okay. sense. That makes sense yeah. because like I know with uh, what I was, e even throughout the book, as I'm sort of piecing through the her version of, of events, it, it's interesting to, to sort of see this fluctuation psychologically within the case where you know, something will apparently happen, like there'll be, for example, like an, a, a so-called attack on her husband, and she's going, oh my god, you know, and the husband's terrified, and then she's saying, well, I'm standing there laughing at him, that this is, that this is happening, yeah. and I'm, and then the next, next thing you know, it's like, well, we're deciding we're gonna have a seance, and we're just gonna poke the bear, and it's like, well, but why would you do that? Like that, psychologically, it just doesn't fit together for me. So that, yeah, that's what, uh, yeah, anyway. I, yeah, something, I something was... more, something else was going on there with the undercurrent of, of everything that was happening. Big time. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, and again, it's TV. So, yeah. and it's the, and then, then it's the person's individual narrative. And I've, uh, honestly, I've got a book by someone else about a case in Southern California, which Scott Rogo went to. Um, a couple of my colleagues went to, we talked to the people and it was pretty clearly them. I mean, it was not, you know, if there was anything paranormal happening, because there was a reporter who embedded himself with the family for a few weeks and he caught one of the family members faking everything. Jeez. So, you know, the question is, was there ever any real phenomena in those circumstances? But the book clearly yeah. indicates there was and kind of ignores all the other stuff that was going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, that's interesting. No, I thought I'd, I'd throw that out there because it was it, to me. It's it's been such a public case. Yeah. Um, and it's been so discussed and so talked about and sort of pinned as a, a as a you know a landmark case in terms of like poltergeist type phenomenon. And yeah. And if, like, I, if, I, if I if I recall, minute, you know? if I recall correctly, it's one of the cases that made Carrie and me stop working with sightings because apparently they promised the family that they would fly Carrie out for follow up. Um, Carrie found this out. And of course they didn't do that. <laughs> the, the show had never had any intention of doing that. Um, people I dealt with also, same thing. They were promising. This was uh, yeah. the regime, I guess you could say, sightings had changed a bit over time. Um, and then there was the, that other well-known case which keeps popping up and I really wish it wouldn't is the ghost writing case with the right. words. Yeah. The um, photos, yeah, the Polaroids, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, completely ignoring the fact that, um, well, I mean, ABC did a seg was going to do a segment on one of the shows, even flew me down to LA. Yeah. And that's the whole story in itself because they never aired the segment because there were some very suspicious things happening there. Oh, so and Carrie was yeah. suspicious of the whole thing as well. Yeah, I believe. Well, he's no dumb bunny. I mean, he would oh not, not he, at all. He would, you know, he, if anybody's gonna pick it out, it's gonna be it's gonna be him. So yeah. yeah. Right. All right. Well, anyway, I'll let somebody else chat. All right. So Darcy's there. got her hand up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I had to mention I, I wanted to thank you for bringing forward the the point of the consciousness of entities. Um, Morgan he heard me venting about this about a week or so ago. I think she probably remembers. <laughs> but um, how sometimes, it, like, well, a lot of times it tends to get forgotten that we're dealing with entities under trauma. And um, I actually, uh, after reading a uh, book, uh, The Body Keeps a Score uh, on PTSD, and I actually got to a point where I approached one of our teammate members who's a trauma advocate. And I said, how would you like to join us on investigations? And she was like, oh, to work with the client? I said, maybe. <laughs> and I told her my ideas and, and she's just like, oh. She says, yeah, a lot of these guys are trapped in trauma. A lot of these entities tend to be trapped in trauma. Is there some way you think we can help with the approach of helping release them from that trauma by giving, giving us some pointers of what she would do with a living person? And she was really enthused about that idea. And she told me the next day, I'm in. <laughs> so I'm uh, looking forward to seeing how that's going to work out. But um, I don't know if you'd read the book, The Body Keeps the Score. I have not. Um, um, it's, it's one of, uh, he, he's a landmark uh, uh, researcher on PTSD. He worked with veterans and uh, he was there when they first started uh, coining the phrase. Um, but he would talk about these veterans having these triggers that it would be the slightest thing. It could be an ink blot test. It could be a mm. flash of a color. And then all of a sudden, boom, this thing explodes. And it, all I could think of the entire time I'm listening to him talking about this is this sounds like a haunting. 
how certain things trigger a haunting. You know, it could be the slightest thing that people don't even realize and how these entities can be trapped in cycles. Well, they can't and, get out of. and people ask me about the trapping thing. I'd say that when people trap themselves, you know, that's, that's the trauma or even a belief. You know, uh, we've had cases where um, I talked about apparitions not staying in one, necessarily having to stay in one place, mm -hmm. but it's really interesting from Annette's perspective, and actually way back with talking with um, Alex Tanis, sometimes they have to counsel, <coughs> counsel, let them, you know, like say, have you tried leaving the house? Like I can leave the house. I mean, all the folklore says they're <laughs> stuck where they, you know, where they are. And if you look again, if you look at this as consciousness after death and people don't appreciably change after death, they don't suddenly become all knowing uh, unless they've, I guess, moved on. Um, they have preconceived ideas. And those might block them from doing anything or going anywhere as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, All right, Mark. Where are you? Uh, I'm, I'm doing great. Lloyd, I just first of all want to thank you for the work you've done and honestly for devoting your life to do this kind of work because yeah, you could probably make a lot more money doing a lot of other things and blah, blah, blah. So I have a day job. I, I have to have a day job. I can't do this. Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, I, th I think to me, it shows that you and, and people who devote their lives to these kinds of things do it out. There's a sense of service. And, and I think there really is a lot of service being provided to the world with this kind of work, because this really helps to, to move consciousness forward. So my question uh, is, when it comes to things like understanding reality and things like that, I think there's the, the personal exploration, which provides you your personal answers. And then there might be the more, we'll call it scientific exploration, where you're providing things that would be evidential, if that's the right way to use it. And I'm curious how much personal exploration you might have done, whether it's through meditation, out-of-body experiences, or something like that, that you might not necessarily talk about in a lot of contexts where you're really focused on the evidential side of it, because you need to kind of keep church and state separate in a way. Because I, I find a lot of times the researchers who come to places like this will be like, oh, better keep that separate, because people will then, of course, the second I mention Oh, well, and then I found blah, blah, blah. They'll say, oh, well, so-and-so believes, and this is what they, no, no, no. That was my personal thing. But what I have found evidence for is this over here. And a lot of times people in the new age community, and I don't mean to, that's kind of my big background. A lot of people will not understand there's a difference. There's a big difference. And you can right. have your personal experience and, and be like, oh my God, this, this is what convinced me. But that's not the same thing as what you would go talk to a person who hasn't had that and say to them, this is, this is, you know, persuasive. That might be the right term. This is persuasive, something or other. That's a very different type of conversation. So, well, I mean, I've had, I, I didn't have any real psychic experiences to speak of before I got into parapsychology directly. Um, but working with Alex, just being at the ASPR with Alex Tennis and spending a lot of time around him. He at one point he said, you know, I told him I hadn't had a lot of experiences or really and I knew what when somebody would be on the phone once in a while. I think we all had that experience. I had a couple of psychic readings that I thought were very good. I saw somebody doing a little PK and that was it. And Alex actually said to me, um, stick with me, kid, you'll have experiences. Okay. And I did. <laughs> I mean, I had a couple of out-of-body experiences not too long after that. I haven't had any since. I had some mm -hmm. other experiences over time. It's like the universe telling me, okay, this stuff exists. You should have an experience just so you personally know that this is real. Uh, but it's important, and, and you're absolutely right, kind of separating the, being able to be very clear, this is my personal opinion or belief based on my experience and on the evidence. I mean, that's what I usually say. If the evidence wasn't there, it wouldn't matter what my personal belief was when it comes right down to it. The evidence has to be there as well. Uh, and I've been, you know, I had a really good relationship with a lot of skeptics over the years and very oddly because I admitted I believed in this stuff and other parapsychologists wouldn't admit that. So, and they were always just talking about the evidence, but they, for some reason, they thought I'm more credible because I can talk from my experience and I can talk about the experience. 
uh, the, the evidence rather, which again, is kind of odd to me if they're yelling about the fact that there's no scientific evidence. Uh, but I, I kind of think that it was because they felt like I was being truthful even to them, which, you know, considering they're not always truthful to us is a different thing. Um, so I, I, doing investigations, when I take people out, when I go out with, with folks, <laughs> I do, I have learned over the years to pay attention to my perceptions, but I don't like make a deal about them during the session, during the, the episodes. I focus on yeah. if I have psychics there or other things that are going, the witnesses are focused on. And I will bring in my perceptions and see how they match those uh, when I'm kind of collating everything. But otherwise, I, I don't, you know, I don't do it on the spot. Understood. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, Brandon. Hi, thanks, Hi. Lloyd. It was a great, great presentation. I really enjoyed Thank it. Thank you. So, you know, with, with ghostly phenomenon, it, it seems like it's a mixture of I don't know, psychological, environmental, biological, sociocultural, all that stuff is sort of mixed in there, not only with the experience, but how we perceive it as well. Right. And, you know, I, I know environmental variables, whether that's architecture or EMFs or infrasound, aren't the chief cause of this phenomenon. But I was wondering, you have a vast experience, probably been to numerous haunted locations. Um, do you see, it, it seems like some locations are just sort of environmentally remarkable or in experience inducing. Yeah. Do you notice anything that like any reason why one location is haunted and another one has no hauntings, even though tragic deaths and all this drama happened at a non-haunted one? I mean, do you see anything there? Well, first I have to say that in all of my cases, with the rarest exception, when people are reporting things, there's some stuff they're reporting, it's definitely got explanation to it environmental or something else for psychological because people are on edge when they have these experiences typically once they have the single experience and even if that wasn't uh, initially a psychic or paranormal experience to begin with uh, so we have to kind of sort through all that stuff um, I did have one case where it was it's kind of an environmental nightmare when it came down to it the house was slight low off its foundation uh, which made that a single room where they were feeling nauseous it was not quite level and the doors and windows were not 90 degrees so there was a perceptual thing that caused headaches and nausea and they um were right under high tension wires which we were actually measurably able to find had high high frequency sound and low frequency sound both so they're seeing things out of the corner of our eyes and the house was built on the other on the other side of a hill from the martinez landfill and methane gas was seeping up through the air static electricity in the air was causing the methane to occasionally catch on fire <laughs> I mean, these people had come to, I got referred to them by the Martinez Police Department who knew about me, but they had been to every university except for some reason, John F. Kennedy University. Stanford told them to talk, come in for psych testing. UC Berkeley, they were told consistently to come, there's something wrong with them. Four of them having the same experiences. So going in, um, we found these issues right off the bat or relatively quickly. When you have a structure that, induces an experience that people is not in people's normal experience, they're gonna to go to one explanation or another right off the bat. And depending on their background, they might go to a, a paranormal explanation, especially if they've been watching the TV shows, or they might go to a, some other kind of explanation. And I've heard explanations of some environmental stuff that has nothing to do with the paranormal, but also is not correct environmentally because people are not aware. These are things that are not in their normal daily experience. So I had another case where a guy called up saying that his neighbor was using techno some kind of electronics to telepathically attack him on a daily basis. He's this in a, um, a mobile home park it's in Silicon Valley. And he at one point he mentioned that his power bill had gone up like 500%. And I was able to coach him to talk to uh, the local utilities company come out and check out why that was. And it turned out that the neighbor who apparently had lined his entire mobile home with stereo and other equipment that was always on because he was, it turned out he was paranoid schizophrenic. We have a government installation that's nearby for NASA Ames and the NSA, and he felt they were spying on him. So this was blocking all this. Mm -hmm. He had tapped into the power lines of five of his neighbors, including this guy. So the cops came and took that guy away, turned all the power off, they fixed everything, everything was fine. But the, the conclusion or explanation this guy went to was somebody was telepathically attacking me. 
with that. Again, based on their personal beliefs or experiences. So when people find a place is haunted, it could be anything that could trigger that if that's their predisposition or sometimes if they're looking for it. We do know that ghost hunters sometimes look for it. Okay, um, Jane, I know Darcy, you got your hand up still. I don't know if you have another question, but we'll go to Jane first. Yeah, I'm just thinking about what Brandon said. You know, you're, what you described about the Hornet also applies to the battleship North Carolina across the right. river here. I've been, I've been there, yeah. It's great. Um, the uh, Is the fact that it's a metal object sitting in brackish water have anything to do with it? Because that's like a battery. Maybe. I mean, there's a lot of uh, uh, supposed hauntings with naval vessels, including vessels that have been in service. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the Navy Journal, the the was it called the Blue and the Gray or whatever it's called. Uh, I remember years ago reading some articles about haunted ships in service. I mean, there's a long tradition of of boats being haunted, and the Navy acknowledges that. So, um, interestingly enough, with the Hornet, uh, there were a couple of people on the board who were afraid of talking about the ship as haunted, afraid they were going to scare off the Navy that's still supporting the, sh the ship to some extent. They kind of lease it from the Navy. That wasn't a problem at all for for the Navy people. So mm -hmm. it may it may be that the metal object does, but it's hard to say. Um, Darcy, you you have another question or a comment? I do. I just wanted to say thank you, Mark, for bringing up that conversation about keeping the two worlds separate. You have the psychic side, and then you have the observational side. And I remember you having that conversation in our class a couple of times, and how the observer effects going to in, you know influence the investigation anyway. And it, it gave me the uh, confidence to open up. And I started using my own and it really took off from there. But <laughs> I am running into other clients that are struggling with this unregistered psychic ability. And uh, a lot of times they're suffering some of these hauntings worse than other people in the house. And I was wondering if you'd ever seen, and I know we've had conversations before on how to coach them with this sort of thing with anxiety and depression and PTSD and that sort of thing. Have you seen um, some of their anxiety or their bombardment uh, lesson on um, antidepressants and anti-anxiety meds? Um, I have not. Uh, of course, I haven't looked at that. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to remember, I think Barry Taff has looked at that because he's looked at medications as well. Um, I, don't, I don't know that we've actually come up with any sort of correlation to any of that as well okay. at all i know um, i've talked to other mediums about their end, uh, anxiety and depression they said absolutely they will not take any of that medication because it blocks them yeah i mean yeah, I, I definitely like have heard that too i mean i've heard the di different medications even as far back talking to montague ullman back in the in the early like around 1990 91 i talked to him before about this because you know, he was a psychiatrist working sometimes in psychiatric uh, in, uh institutions and he, he did say that he had patients who were paranoid schizophrenic on meds who were still picking up stuff from the staff, which is which was scaring the staff. And he took them off the meds and gave them some visualizations, which apparently fixed it for them. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it didn't look like the meds were actually blocking anything, but it probably is an individual bio, you know, biological thing. It's very individual for how people react to, <clears throat> to medications as well. Okay. You know, uh, alcohol affects people certain ways and doesn't affect other people in other ways. So it, it's true. really hard to tell. Okay, thank you. Nancy. I actually have a question from one of the students. Um, Elaine said, when you talk about apparitions being as much perception as the environment, there are very particular things that people who experience apparitions speak of during or after the experience, such as a sense of presence, directional pull, feeling of being watched, a drop in temperature, and so on. Is there any environmental factor that is particularly significant in your view that may be studied or measured to get you know more at this? You know, there's a lot of controversy about EMF uh, readings in cases. Um, in my own experience, I have found some correlation in the haunting, the imprint cases, um, including having a psychic do a, an, like a mental cleansing of an area that had a high reading. 
uh, that people felt was negative and watching the reading drop to zero, which was very bizarre, I have to say, um, if it was something that was in the physical environment or technologically in the, in the place. Um, but with apparitions, I have not seen any consistency whatsoever with that. And I will also say that the cold spot thing is a problem in a couple different ways. I do know that people feel cold, but it's really important for people when somebody feels cold for some investigator to try to measure if there actually is a temperature change. Because what I have seen is no temperature change, but a psychological sense of feeling cold, a cold chill, which we can feel at other times as well. Now, on the other hand, we did have, I did have this really impressive case in Florida, which we shot for a TV pilot back in the 90s, where at one point we had the medium from Japan, Aiko Kibo, speaking to the ghost that the people had seen, this little girl, and every piece of equipment we had, including a geomagnetic sensing station that we had rented, went off. Um, I mean, everything was was going haywire at that point, including a Geiger counter, which frankly worried me a little bit. Uh, and then that was happening one, one evening, the next night when she was alone in a room with a producer, a camera on a tripod, we were shooting from the other room, just watching from the other room, monitoring this. We also had a thermal vision camera set up. And it was this was July in central Florida, no air conditioning, windows open, late at night. It was 97 degrees throughout the house. Um, we watched over a 20-minute period, just watching and listening to Mrs. Gibo speaking in Japanese, uh, have somebody translating for us. We watched the walls, the temperature of the walls, get cooler, it got darker on the thermal vision. And when we went in, we measured that it had dropped from 97 to 75 in that room. Now, if you wanna call that a cold spot, fine. But what was really interesting was the bedroom just off this, uh, this central room where the couple was, was kind of relaxing and trying to get to sleep. They came out when they heard the noise in the other room and their room had jumped up to 110 degrees as if there was a transfer of heat. Not that the apparition needed anything to manifest like so many people talk about. And that's about the only anomaly I've ever seen in these circumstances, aside from some environmentally created cold spots that do show up, where you can actually track back and eventually figure out what the environmental source happens to be for the cold spot. But I haven't seen any, I mean, there's no consistency. Um, you know, I, I don't even know if when we're, if you did measure an EMF uh, on, a, on a device with an apparition, whether or not it's the apparition using PK on the device. Or if it's me doing PK on the device. Yeah, I'll be interested in hearing what you have to say after you see Rob Tilley's um, talk from the day before yesterday and also Tim Hart's, which was... Uh, that he got to the Mesa at the end, we went through a timeline of, of uh, apparitions and so on. It was actually really nice. It was had a wonderful pace and lots of information, but there was an interesting discussion at the end there about um, uh, these arrays of various things that people use. Um, Tom Ruffles was on the on the call, so he put some information up about uh, Tony Tony Cornell's spider, that, spider, that yeah. table that he and Alan used to drag around. So, um, well, I, but I think, I'd be interested in what, what you have to say. I mean, I think what we need are, are good apparition cases where mm -hmm. someone has indicated the apparition is present because just having equipment when you don't know if there's an apparition there or not, you know, let, let's face it, if there's an apparition who's conscious, that apparition does not need to be in the room when you set up your equipment. Just like I can leave the room. If, if they truly are conscious, they do not have to be there to be detected, if that's the case. So you need someone, like I was mentioning Mrs. Gibo, the Japanese medium, someone interacting in a way that indicates that there's somebody present. And if nobody experiences something, you just have an environmental anomalies in a place that might might or might not have an apparition because you don't have any, any witness, any testimony to back that up. So we, we have that basic problem right off the bat. And I think in that case I mentioned uh, in Florida, we did have... The intention, uh, and Mrs. Gibo can really put that out, that this ghost should affect things. And we've had that happen in other cases where we've asked very polite, politely, please, can you affect this device? Can you do this? But ultimately, we don't know, again, if we're measuring what we're actually measuring, because we do know that living people can affect electronics to some extent. 
with PK. We see that with random number generators and other devices. So maybe it's not even affecting the environment. Maybe that entity is just affecting the equipment. I have another question from from uh, uh, first. Uh, Elaine said, uh, "Thank me for channeling her very well." <laughs> so she she thought um, that what you said was exactly her own feelings about it. That there's not enough consistency for significance. Um, Leah Sterling, who was uh, who uh, was in the uh, Rob Tilley's talk, she asked. Um, can you comment on the impact to perceptions of the TV shows? We don't have these regularly on Aust Australian TV. I have personally never watched a series of any of these shows, but what kind of impact do they have? Um, you're lucky that you don't have the shows. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, they have had an enormous impact uh, on the, the general public, but it's a, it's a segment of the general public that watches those shows. Uh, and then there's the folklore that kind of spreads as people who watch those shows talk to their friends who never watch the shows. Uh, there's a lot of really weird stuff on those shows that is a creation of television. And that's the impo most important thing I can say is we have too many people in the public who will watch something that's called reality TV and expect that that's real. Way too many people. Um, I grew up in the TV industry. My dad and my uncle both worked in that industry. My brother David currently works in the industry. My brother Ron works in the movie industry. I've been around this since I was a little kid. So I've been around behind the scenes and have been involved in, in a number of the uh, shows like Sightings and Unsolved Mysteries and other those shows, and even a couple of the reality shows in interviews with me. They have a particular story to tell. And the story has got to be either spooky or emotionally evocative enough to, to keep the ratings going because they want to keep their, that's the whole idea. And there are more and more of these shows that are trying variations of the theme. Um, Discovery Plus, which is a, a streaming service, actually has an entire paranormal channel within or track that they're actually doing newer shows. <clears throat> it's just amazing how, because these are, sh are cheap shows to produce, but they provide a folklore or add to popular culture folklore and support the ideas of pop culture, such as, you can only do ghost hunting at night in the dark. You have to turn the lights out. Ghosts only appear, you know, and 3 a.m. seems to be the best time to do investigations because that's when ghosts are most active, which makes absolutely no sense for a couple of reasons. One of which is it may be quiet environmentally, but to say that that ghost is only going to show up at three o'clock when no witness has ever been woken up by the ghost at three o'clock in the morning is a little bit, it's making really bad assumptions. If people have had experience, I've talked to some of the people on these TV shows who are the ghost hunters, and they have told me that, well, we have to do it in the dark. That's what the producers want us to do. I said, what if the people only see the ghosts at one o'clock in the afternoon? We still, we might talk to them about that, but we still have to do it in the dark because that's TV. It's all about TV and what is presented. And if night shot cameras had never been developed, we would not be seeing ghost hunters on TV working in the dark. So we have to assume and, and always ask in investigations, do you watch any of those shows? Which shows do you watch? What mm -hmm. have you seen? I've had before the shows, I would have to ask, you know, years ago, I would ask them, what do you read? Um, I had a case where I walked in the house and they had a stack of the Weekly World News and the National Enquirer and the Star, all, and they kept all the ones that had ghost stories on the covers. And they, they kind of giggled about it, but I thought, okay, this is definitely affecting their perceptions of what's going on even if they just read them for fun. So we have to include that because there's this huge popular culture folklore that is continuing to evolve based on these TV shows now and the things that have generated off the shows, including ma people making devices that they claim can pick up ghosts and do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, when, when uh, Mark was saying about, you know, not making a living or, or making a living at this and so on, I could have, I was offered something back in the late 80s. I just felt it was highly unethical to make claims about things that were actually not true or to start a club without really training people. Today, we have people that just watch a TV show and that's enough of an education. But that's like, yeah. saying, that's like saying of watching Real House, any of the Real Housewife shows, that's actually reality. <laughs> and it's not. Here. It's unscripted. I, I have another, I have a comment from Elaine. She says there's a guy called Dylan Jones who's studying the effect of the media 
on how paranormal investigations get carried out, he found that there's less of an impact that people are impacted more by other people who they are in contact with or investigating with. And then she says he's three years into a six six year doctorate, so she's looking forward to seeing what he finally oh, yeah. finds out. I'll I'll take a, I I know who Dylan Jones is. I'll have to check in on that. Ah. I, I'm teaching a pop culture class right now and its impact on people. I know I saw that. I just yeah. oh um yeah carlos would have loved that um well i want we both wanted you to do that for atlantic and and yeah. uh i'm I I seriously thinking about you know like signing up <laughs> well you I, know, really I, like I, I think there i think that statement if there is something to that um but you have a core group of people who are following the methodologies that they see on tv and then from that you have other people coming into those groups i know that um Ross Allison, who's up in Seattle, had a group, had a group, one of the early groups in Seattle called A Ghost. And he mm -hmm. still he still does work, right? Um, at one point there were there were 50 groups in the Seattle area that had spun off of A Ghost. Darn. Because they didn't like what he was doing, or they were bored because nothing was happening. So they had to start their own, or there was infighting in there. And I've seen the same thing happen in Sacramento and other places. Um, and Ross was really trying to do stuff from a parapsychological perspective or bring stuff in and wasn't just simply accepting everything. So we see this kind of contamination effect that happens. And that happens with media just in general. I mean, the fact that some people believe that a movie is based that is based on or inspired by a true story, that that's actually the story because they know nothing about how movies are made or or anything else. That's yeah, what happens to them. Yeah. One of the things I love on YouTube are all of the history folks that, that will come out and do a review in terms of accuracy, not just of the weapons and the clothing, but the the you know, the somebody did one on Last Kingdom and the and the Utrecht, the the main character is like an amalgam of three of the actual Utrecht, you know, father, grandfather, and right. son and all that kind of stuff. So they they that's something that people don't really think about is that there's so much um there are other agendas with a visual medium like that which is something you taught us i mean that that you're going to take those details and push them away if they're not going to be visual enough or they're not going to be interesting enough or you, it would be better if this guy was that guy so let's m morph them up to a little bit yeah it's interesting and it makes it makes uh, life difficult i'm sure for the investigators Mark, did you have something else you wanted to say? I, I just wanted to say when you brought up Ross and Seattle, uh, it's complicated. It really is because I, 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 I interacted with Ross and I like Ross a lot personally. Uh, but some of the things when you all talked about some of the stuff that people will do to try to get ghosts, you know, like some of the TV stuff, I think Ross has eventually gotten corrupted to a degree by a little bit of that and i'm not trying to bad mouth him because i like ross a lot personally just love the guy but that's what's so hard about this is mm. it's hard and and i find that when i was involved in the wiccan community and a lot of communities i remember somebody telling me you know why can't i be a pagan clergy and have a congregation just like a catholic church and i said well you can't have 10 people who are in the pot below the poverty line supporting you the way a Catholic priest does with, you know, 200 congregants, many of whom are wealthy people. I mean, that's just, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, my friend. I mean, there's a, a reality level there. So that's the hard thing is trying to balance this world that we live in with being on that front edge of really pushing things forward. So that's why I think I have to say again, hats off to people who have found how they just balance all of this. And mm -hmm. so throwing no no arrows because I, I have not done that. I fully work in the IT world and I have to sit on this side of it and really admire people who have made these huge sacrifices to move the field forward and to really you know, do these things. And I know it would be hard for me, you know, so I, it's tough. It really is. So hats off and well, thank you, know, you for bringing all these things up. Sure. And I have to say that um, 
myself, I know Carrie, I know Get Barry Taft for sure. I mean, Barry was actually talked to by the producers from uh, from Pilgrim Productions, Ghost Hunters, before they talked to Jason and Grant. And he turned them down partly because, well, partly because they weren't going to pay anything, which is unfortunately mm -hmm. not uncommon for reality TV for the first season. I wouldn't do it either, even if it was a great show. Uh, you know, if you can afford to take a year off from everything, that's great. But the other reason he turned them down is because he asked, they, they indicated they would fake things. And how did he feel about that? And he said, no. And I've, you know, dealt with folks as well um, over the years who really wanted to amp up the emotion. Um, I did a segment for Unsolved Mysteries. They flew me to Wisconsin for a case. And uh, the director was an ass. He kept on trying to get me to say this was a demonic situation. It was a poltergeist case. and It was a mild one to begin with, although it made the papers. And the people who were living in the house weren't the new people who were living in the house had no experience whatsoever, you know, but they were trying to say that it was still that. And I would not say that. I kind of stuck to my guns on that. And I found out that I got cut in favor of a local minister who never went to the house, knew nothing about the case, who talked about demons. So it's there's a particular story sometimes that, the, that a producer or director wants to, to sell or show. And for the series, um, I don't know if people remember, but the initial show Ghost Hunters, when they first started, Jason and Grant, a lot of it was about their personality and going to barbecues and all that. It wasn't even about the phenomena at all. And that's what reality is about. Reality shows are about those people, not about the phenomena at all. And so anything they can do to amp up the emotion, to amp up the story, to show it visually, even though it's not accurate, all of those things are going to be the case. So um, it, it's unfortunate. Um, there were times in the 80s that when I was asked, you know, if I have any devices that make sounds and light up, uh, I pulled out my toy Star Trek tricorder, which I usually used to keep in my kit. and it never failed. The The director or producer got really excited because they were never Star Trek fans, but the, the camera guy always was and would stop rolling at that moment and let me continue. So it was this un, always this, un, you know, I'd already talked to them about my dad's experience in TV and stuff, and it was always an easy thing to do. But I'm kind of glad that they never showed that because it would have been a problem for them le legally to show a toy like that. Yeah, I have a communicator and I would I wouldn't mind, you know. Um, yeah. Leah, uh, Leah has another question. Um, can you also com comment on consciousness from her neuroscience studies? Uh, she says she's aware that consciousness is very late to happen after per after perception, and in many cases, perce perception brain areas respond before the stimulus stimulus has been delivered. So, what does your experience bring to the discussion on consciousness? That we, there's a lot we don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's really all I can say. I, I, you know, I've read um, Stuart Hameroff's stuff and uh, Penrose's stuff. And I've also read and talked to folks on the other side who talk about consciousness kind of filtering through our bodies from out there, kind of like we are, we are actually the interface for the cloud, more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a, you know, there's philosophical divides here. There are different ways to look at neuroscience and the results there. It's this is a bigger question than many of the other questions we have. And I don't know that we're going to answer it directly very easily. Um, the brain probably, you know, to me, to my mind, personally, I believe that the brain does play a role in development of consciousness. But then what do we deal with when we have the kids who remember previous lives? What are, we, what are they picking up on? What has come through? If it's their brain that's developing, what are they getting? Where are they getting that information from? So it's hard to say. Well, and like terminal lucidity that Michael Dom has written about too, this notion where you're, yeah. there's not a whole lot of that brain uh, still working and they manage to wake up and say goodbye to their loved ones, have clear conversations and so on as if they've separated a bit from the physical apparatus. Well, you know, when, when I mentioned Annette Martin coming out of in really intense, she had much sedation because she was in real pain and she mm -hmm. came out of that without pain the doctor who was there was completely baffled and Bruce talked to the doctor afterwards. And mm -hmm. he had no, literally no, there's no way a human being could come out of the sedation we can't, we gave her. That's what it is. And response. they do it. And they do it. Yeah. Yeah. So I can't help myself. I need to ask, is the Moss, uh, Moss Beach distillery lady still out there? The last I heard of her, she was, she figured out she could go to Paris. <laughs> 
That was a long time ago. That was 2000, I know. 2005. I know. Uh, yeah, she is. She is. I haven't been there in a little over a year, actually about a year and a half now, partly because of um, the previous owner uh, or the owner, John Barber, who died in December of 2021. And they spent a number of months trying to get back up and running. And then, of course, we opened up. And more recently, I've wanted to go down there, but with all the roads are washed out. They're on the coast. Oh. We've got our weather issues. Yeah, uh, but, you have terrible, people, right. Are, yeah, people are still having experiences down there. The, the staff that I know that have been there for a long time still have occasional experiences. Well, she she certainly is a huge candidate for consciousness and seems to be having a heck of a time with her. Yeah, that was a much longer story. I didn't didn't think I had time to <laughs> go into that. <laughs> no, I know it's long. Yeah. yeah. Randy, did you have something you wanted to comment on? Uh, no, uh, just always enjoy listening to uh, Lloyd's uh, take on things. Thanks, Me Randy. too. Anytime he opened his mouth, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> It's just fascinating. I say well, I, yeah, exactly. Um, Lizette uh, had to take off. She said, uh, "Gotta run," but great job as always, Lloyd. Um, uh, thank you. And uh, Jane is saying, "I have to go too." Thanks, Lloyd, and thanks, Nancy. Great MOOC. Um, who was that, Nancy? Oh, Leah does no uh, Moss Beach Distillery. And what what was what's her name? The, the her name's Kate. Beach? As far and that's what she's Megan? told us. Her name's Kate. C A Y T E. Kate. Kate. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's it's in one of your books, isn't it? Uh, a couple of my books: uh, Paranormal Casebook and books. Ghost Detective's Guide to Haunted San Francisco. Pam Heath, who I see is just now, see is on here, has had experiences there too, and uh, yeah. Ah. Oh, good. Well, that that's good. We have to, we'll have to, um, I'll, I'll get back to you so that I can put it in. If I can't find it my own self, I'll put it in the, uh, put it in the description. Okay. Well, we're, we're at uh, uh, two hours from the moment that we started and, and a little bit more. And so I just want to thank you so much for hanging in here. And, and you also had the, the, you also win the sweepstakes in terms of the number of people that showed up. I think we were at 24 at the time. Oh, great. So yeah, so so we are down to 16 instead of up to 16. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Um, but I want to thank you again. It, it's really excellent. And um, we certainly didn't have, uh, we certainly had a lot of people coming in at the beginning <laughs> who got there and they're, oh my God, I'm sorry I did that uh, email. And then a few people coming in at 4.30, but really excellent. And I will probably be getting back to you for anything that you think I haven't put into the <clears throat> description. Okay. So, Good. and hopefully that'll come over the, the weekend. And I'm, I am really truly uh, interested in your opinions on uh, Rob's uh, presentation and Tim's as well, okay. because I'll, I thought they I'll, were both really interesting in totally different ways. They looked interesting. So, I just didn't have time, unfortunately, to watch them yet, so. Ah, uh, not to worry, not to worry. That's why there's videos, so it's okay. Right. Right. Well, thank you all for coming, and thank you um, for everybody that had a question or a comment or an applause or whatever. We're just and everybody that was willing to come on on uh, on the video as well. We really like that. So I, I just wanted to say thank you so much. And I need to go back to, uh, if you don't mind, Lloyd, I'm going to go back to my. Um, my uh my powerpoint yes we see that great thank you okay so this is what's next let me move over tomorrow at noon central uh, brian and i are going to host a um open discussion forum and basically we're you know going to do what we've done in other MOOCs we'll bring back the the pages of all of the people who have spoken since the beginning of the course but we can talk about absolutely anything underneath the topic of apparition apparitions hauntings and poltergeist and I hope I hope you will come and join us on Sunday we have Allison Jornlin from AmericanGhostWalks.com in Milwaukee she's going to be talking about the hidden ghost hunter remembering Catherine Crow and that's at 2 p.m central on Sunday the 19th she developed Milwaukee's oops excuse me Milwaukee's first haunted history tour in 2008 and I love that she is describing herself as a professional weirdo I kind of think of myself that way too 
research, researching and writing for AmericanGhostWalks.com and her YouTube channel. I am going to give you a recommendation right now to go out there and put paranormal women into the search bar on YouTube because there's some very interesting things going on there. And um, uh, not the least of which is, is a video about Catherine Crow, who we will all know a lot more about on Sunday. So thank you so much, you guys. I am uh, so grateful that uh, you all came. And thank you, Lloyd. And uh, have a good afternoon, evening, morning, middle of the night, whatever it happens to be, wherever you are. So bye now. Bye.